Good morning, good afternoon, good welcome, good night, good whatever time it is where you are. Welcome to today's Math Minute. I want to follow up on the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. So a couple months ago, I posted about the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra, my favorite theorem, and then I reposted at least a portion of that video on that, you know, other social video sharing platform. And I got some pushback from uh, one commenter in particular who was insistent that the way I talked about the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra, which was mainly in terms of real numbers and and real solutions was illegitimate because the fundamental theorem of algebra is a statement about complex numbers. And first of all, to be sure, I am not a mathematician, I am an eighth grade math teacher. So it's entirely possible that the way I spoke about the fundamental theorem of algebra was not accurate. And I invite your comments, mathematicians who are watching this, I don't know, with your kids or something. Am I messing up the fundamental theorem of algebra? I'm gonna talk through my understanding now and why I begin in terms of real solutions. So the fundamental theorem of algebra, without diving into the strict definition just yet, is a statement about the connection between what's called the degree of a polynomial and the number of solutions that that polynomial has. I've got right here a cubic function. That is a third degree polynomial. You can see it has three solutions. In eighth grade or ninth grade algebra terms, a solution is where the graph of a polynomial crosses the x-axis. Now, of course, you may remember from eighth or ninth grade algebra that we can take these polynomials and we can move them up and down such that it's going to change the number of times that the polynomial does actually cross that x-axis. So are we changing the number of solutions? We are changing the number of of real solutions, but the fundamental theorem of algebra confirms for us actually not changing the number of complex solutions. So a complex number, you may remember, is actually a superset of the real numbers. Complex numbers typically occur to us in the form a plus bi, where a is the real part of the number and bi is the imaginary part of the number, coming from that imaginary i. Lots of polynomials have solutions of this form. For example, consider something like zero equals x squared minus three x plus nine. If you try to factor this to find rational solutions, you won't be able to. If you try to plug it into the quadratic formula to find some real solutions, you won't be able to. What you'll get back from the quadratic formula is positive three plus or minus nine minus 36 all divided by two, which eventually simplifies down to three plus or minus three i root three over two. Or if we put it in terms of these complex numbers, three over two would be the real part, and then three root three over two i would be the imaginary part. If we take a look at the graph of that quadratic, we can see why it didn't have real solutions. It's way up here above the x-axis. If we take that constant at the end, which was nine, and we just make it smaller, 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 we can eventually cause that graph to first touch on the x-axis, in which case it would have one real solution. Or if we push that parabola down a little bit further, obviously we see those two real solutions once again. We can do the same thing with this cubic that I started looking at. We can push it down to the point where we get just the one real solution. We can push it up to a point where we get two intersections rather than all three. Of course, we can see three intersections. And if we continue pushing it up, we get once again two intersections and eventually just one intersection. So what's going on? Where are these real solutions going? The fundamental theorem of algebra tells us basically we're going to conserve the number of solutions no matter what. It's just that the solutions end up being complex numbers with non-zero imaginary portions rather than real numbers. But it's frustrating to me. I love the coordinate plane. I wanna be able to see the solutions. Did they just disappear? Are they still up here in some sense? But they've been moved around for some reason? And also maybe I remember there are these various axes of symmetry that are supposed to tell me about the solutions. Do those still count even when I go into the complex numbers? And the answer is yes. And we can even visualize why the answer is yes. But to be able to visualize that, we have to move into something called the complex plane. Not our real plane, where we relate some real number x to some other real number y, but instead the complex plane, where we're going to visualize our real part of the number a, and that's going to look like an x-axis, and then our imaginary axis b, which is going to go up and down like a y-axis typically would. This means essentially, rather than look at a number line for our input, 
inputs, we're now looking down on top of a plane. You can see that plane here for that same cubic we were looking at earlier, x cubed minus 3x squared minus x plus 3. Looking down at our inputs now, we can see the real number negative 1 plus 0i. So when I'm along that real axis, my imaginary part is zero. And that was one of the roots of this particular cubic. And then one plus zero i would be this root here. And then over here, three plus zero i was the third root of that initial cubic. But I can't graph this like we did before because that up and down portion is not the result of the function, it's the imaginary part of the function. And so instead what we're doing here is we're coloring the complex plane in order to try to visualize the two-dimensional surface that is this polynomial. Over the complex numbers, we're relating what is essentially a two-dimensional number, a plus bi, as our input to another two-dimensional number, c plus di, as the output. But if you have two two-dimensional numbers, that means you would need four dimensions to visualize what's going on. So it's a lot harder to visualize these functions as we input and output complex numbers. However, although it's harder, it's not impossible. There are ways to visualize complex valued polynomials. So let's consider that same plane that we were looking at a second ago, but now we're gonna give it some perspective. There's our imaginary axis, there's our real axis, and I'm going to draw in a third axis. This would be like the actual y of our initial xy coordinate plane. So you can imagine just one thin slice, the y axis, the x axis here, going through the complex plane itself. And so the initial function would have gone up here and then down and then back up. And that's the cubic that we were looking at before. It still has its same roots at negative one plus zero i, one plus zero i, and three plus zero i. Now what we're gonna do is take that function and we're gonna to start to move it up, just like we were doing before in our real plane, but now we're doing it in the complex plane. You can see that these two solutions over here on the positive real axis start to get closer together as we move that upward opening part of the cubic up through the real plane, to the point where as we move them, we get closer and closer to that scenario where it looked like we went down to just one real solution, just one intersection at that part of the positive x-axis. But then remember, after we pulled it up a little bit more, something weird happened. Although we no longer had three real solutions, the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us we must still have three complex solutions. We will always have the same number of solutions in the complex numbers as the degree of our polynomial. But where do they go, right? It's getting a little harder to visualize, but hopefully you can tell, huh, it seems like they're moving outward away from our real axis and into the imaginary portions of the complex plane. As we take the original slice further and further up, we can see those solutions getting further and further away from our real axis, to the point where when it gets high enough above the positive x-axis, we can see two very distinct roots out in the complex plane. There's a great GeoGebra visualization of what's happening here. So this is basically the same picture as what we were looking at a second ago. You're looking at the real axis here, just like we were before, and then the imaginary axis, and so this is the complex plane. And then we have our real y-axis. Right now we're looking at a quadratic, and this is just that one slice that would come from the actual real coordinate plane. Just like we did before, we can move this up and down, but you'll see when we move it far enough up, we get a second visualization. Because the actual function here is a two-dimensional surface, not just the one-dimensional thread of the parabola. And that two-dimensional surface looks more like a saddle. Again, perhaps you can visualize here, here is one portion of the saddle, and then the complex portion of the saddle is going out into the imaginary portions of the complex plane. I am terrible at drawing, so I really don't know that I can do a great job of visualizing it. No, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. But you know what a saddle looks like, right? In any case, you can see that the saddle is what's actually moving those roots further away from the real axis in the complex plane. But the total number of solutions is always conserved. And so there you have it. That's your fundamental theorem of algebra. The degree of a polynomial is going to tell you how many solutions solutions to expect. It's just that those solutions aren't always real solutions. Something I said in the original video I did 
is that the coordinate plane itself was a huge innovation. In the 16th century, Rene Descartes puts together this thing that all of a sudden lets us relate algebraic equations like polynomials to geometrical objects like parabolas. And so we can use the insights from geometry in order to inform our understanding of the algebra. The same thing is true here. The better we can visualize complex numbers in the complex plane itself, the more insights we're going to have into what's going on algebraically with these polynomials. There are lots of different ways to visualize this. Again, the chief difficulty comes from the fact that mapping a complex number to another complex number requires four spatial dimensions, but we are really only good at visualizing three. There are different ways we deal with this problem. I showed you one, which is basically a projection where we just ignore the imaginary part of the output, and we look at just that one slice of the two-dimensional mapping at a time. But there are others that have to do with coloring. Uh, there are others that have to do with perspective. I've always thought it would be really cool if you could somehow, and I am not the programmer to do it, I'm a terrible programmer, but if you could somehow layer two complex planes on top of each other, one down here for your inputs, one up here for your outputs, and somehow thread certain inputs to outputs and try to visualize what's happening four-dimensionally that way. So if there are any programmers out there who want to give that a shot, I'd love to see that. But otherwise, let me know, how do you visualize the four-dimensional complex biplane? I don't know what you would call it. Like and subscribe. Let me know what I got wrong. Surely there were lots of things, and otherwise I will see y'all next time.